Yes, so, uh, she's promised to keep us awake with a riveting talk, which is the AUVSO for your research in the large surveys area. Over to you, Stella. Thank you. So, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you to uh, Case and Alex for having me here. Uh, it's my second time in South Africa, second time in Africa, and oh my gosh, I'm looking forward to the next time on this thing. So today I would like to start the discussion that is going to occupy us for the next couple of days. Uh, large surveys. Where do we as citizen astronomers belong? What kind of contributions have we made? And I would like to talk to you a little bit about the AASO in this era. What we are offering to you in order to get you better prepared to contribute to scientific discovery during this era of large survey. So I'd like to start by reminding you that the AASO started in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Yes, the coal came, the one that's under snow right now, in uh, 1911, when the then director of the Harvard Observatory gathered a group of non professional astronomers to take data for his projects. Since then, we have really evolved. Uh, we are international uh, and we are multicultural. This is a map of, the, uh, of pretty much the world showcasing where ABSO observers and members are. We're talking about both uh, professional and non-professional astronomers who are interested in one or another aspect of our, our um, uh, science, They're interested in gathering data, analyzing data, discussing data, etc., etc. So here's South Africa, and I hope that this talk is going to be larger with time. <laughs> The reason why we're doing what we're doing is because we want to enable anyone, anywhere to participate in scientific discoveries of our star astronomy. And the key word from here is participate. This is our mission. We want our observers to be part of this excitement of scientific discovery. We want you to be members of this collaboration, international collaboration, that is trying to understand some of the most dynamics and most, most fascinating objects in the night sky. And we saw some examples in the morning and afternoon session. Uh, but um, before I start telling you more about the ages or about large surveys, um, I understand that we have a very diverse audience here. So let's play a game. Who likes games? Who doesn't like games? Well, come on, let's play. So the game goes as follows. This is a part of the night sky. And each dot that you see here is a star. Bigger dots are brighter stars, smaller dots are fainter stars. And what I want to do here is characterize each star by assigning a name, right, a number right next to it. And because it's my name and I'm making the rules, what I'm going to do is assign the smaller number to the larger star, the larger dot, and the larger number to the smaller dot. So this one is number 51, this one is number 91. And with these rules, this one is number 64, this one 61, 85, 75. Yes? So here is an object, here is a star, a mystery star, that does not have an assigned number to it. So, taking into account the rules of the game, what number would you assign to the mystery object? 52 and a half. 62. 63. 62. 63. 63. 63. 63. 63. 63. Okay. So, I go out for a different time, um, a week later. Same deal, same stars, same, same numbers. And here's your mystery object. How bright is your mystery object tonight? So the bottom line is, it's not as bright as this, right? It, it's not as bright as this. It's closer to brightness than this one. So it would be 91, sure. something. So a week later, Here's the same part of the sky, and here's your mystery object. How bright is it tonight? 64. 64. So the main idea here, 64, 64, so it's not as bright as this, it's not as faint as this, right? Um, it's not as bright as this one. Is it as bright as this? Maybe. Is it as bright as this? <laughs> Brighter, fainter? Yeah, so it's somewhere between these two, right? So your mystery object is a variable star. It's a star whose brightness is changing every time we go out and observe it with respect to other stars in its vicinity. And by the way, we just filled our first visual light for it. 
So a light curve is exactly that. It's a sort of record of brightness variation with time of an object whose brightness is changing with respect to other objects whose brightness are not changing. And here's another example. Here's another light curve of a variable star. And this would be a light curve of a non-variable star. We take 51, we would actually record it every time we're doing an observation. It would be a flat line. Yes? So the ADSO has been recording uh, variable star light curves since 1911, actually since before 1911. And this is pretty much showcasing the number of points that we have. This is uh, in mi millions of uh, data points that we have in our database. We are curating a database of, of objects. We have about 25,000 light curves in our database right now, 700 of which have data since 1911, are part of our legacy program, our long-term monitoring of uh, variables that started back in the Harvard Observatory. And you know, this number, right over more than 35 million data points, it might not sound impressive if you just think about the data volume that exists in all kinds of databases, but considering that these were data that were collected by non-professional astronomers all over the world in order to enrich light curves of really crazy objects, this is actually a really very valuable resource for research for professional astronomers, non-professional astronomers, students, you name, whomever wants to actually look at the behavior of the star that's changing with time. So where are we now? Right now we live in what I would like to call golden era of uh, astronomy, viral star astronomy, in the sense that anyone who is anyone actually has a survey. And not only that, there are so many space missions that are going to be monitoring the night sky to discover um, all kinds of objects. That is, it's an overwhelming time for, for uh, viral star research. Uh, pretty much I think that the, the whole game started with the Kepler satellite which was actually looking at the same uh, part of the night sky for four years in a row. Actually, up until Kepler, we thought that we knew everything about stars. We know all kinds of variability types. Uh, we know what stars are doing, so let's go find planets around them. Let's go find uh, rocks around them. And the number one lesson that the Kepler satellite taught us for these four years of, uh, of monitoring of the same part of the sky is that we don't understand stars. It started discovering modes of variability in stars that were supposed to be constant. It started discovering long-term variations in objects that we thought that we knew. And actually, it started producing false positives of exoplanet transits in stars that had no, no planets around them. So what Kepler taught us is that we need to go back to the drawing board. We need to understand stellar variability and to better understand it really well before we actually start screaming that, oh my god, we found the next x -rays. Yes? And the same thing with everything else, all these other surveys. Everybody who has a survey out there is going to tell you that they're going to discover everything about the night sky. Case closed. After the survey, we'll know everything. However, what they're not, they're not telling you is that all those surveys have limitations. They're not perfect. They have limits. First of all, they look at the same part of the sky with only one filter, with very few exceptions, LSST being one of them. So one filter means no color information, means you're looking at a very narrow band of the electromagnetic spectrum. What happens up, uh, after that? The second thing that they're not telling you is that the cadence is very limited. When you have only one um, satellite, one telescope, looking at the part of the sky, it cannot be looking at everywhere and cannot be looking at all exposure times. What that means is that it's going to be missing. It's going to be looking at certain parts of the sky every week, for example, or every second day, or for three days in a row. And then what? Most importantly, single sight, one instrument. How many times have we been clouded out? How many times are instruments having problems? So continuous monitoring all this that is advertised is not necessarily possible unless if you are in space. Most importantly, all those surveys have very specific science cases that they need to satisfy. Most of them are built, designed to actually um, discover exoplanets. What that means though is that the cadence, the filters, the, the everything that the instruments that they're choosing are not necessarily good enough 
or anything else. LSST is going to be a dark energy mission. It's not a, a variability survey. And actually, the saturation, the bright saturation limit for LSST is 17. This is one thing that we, we don't realize. If you want to do real good science, you really need to go right than that. multi wavelength science. So at this point, there is a big gap in data acquisition that cannot be filled from, from professional telescopes. Most one meter plus telescopes and smaller are closing simply because there's not enough money to find small telescopes or smaller telescopes and big ones as well. So who is going to do all this work? Uh, in order to actually get good science out of this, we really need your help. We really need you to be engaged in, in uh, data position, data analysis, in this fun game that's called variable star astronomy. In other words, professional astronomers are looking at collaborators through your community. And what I would like to spend some time uh, doing, actually, is telling you how the ADSO can help you be part of this. So the first thing that we do, we train observers. We make sure that you're well equipped uh, to take the best data that you can take with the means that you choose to take them. So with that, we have different roles, um, pretty much different people learning different ways. We have manuals, and those manuals actually range from uh, visual observing, binocular observing, looking through your eyes, how to get started. DSLR observing is very, very popular, and DSLR camera on a tripod can do so much. CCD observing. We have a manual on solar observing, how to safely observe the sun. We have a manual on exoplanets, so how to observe exoplanet transits. We have what we call choice courses. So these are online seminars, they last for four uh, weeks. Uh, they are pretty much ways of training our observers all over the world. Actually, we just finished one on exoplanets. Uh, the main idea is to make sure that you, uh, you get the techniques that you need um, in order to actually observe in the mode that you feel comfortable with. So we have choice courses on, on other than exoplanets, CCD photometry, DSLR, visual, uh, even an introduction to the night sky. What are variable stars? What are the light curves? Uh, we have a very active peer mentoring program. Some people actually uh, learn better when they sit right next to a very, um, very uh, experienced observer. So we are pairing novice observers with experienced observers to actually bounce ideas, to get, get hints of how to observe. And actually for a person like me, when I started my visual program two years ago, my binoculars program, this worked much better. For me, it was much easier to actually communicate with someone who had done it before to give me hints of how to actually get started, how to continue, and how to even acquire data visually. The, third, the second thing that we're doing is that we are actually telling you which stars are of interest to observe. Um, there are millions of stars in the night sky. Uh, so how would you know what kind of project you need to pursue? And we're doing it through different, uh, two different roles. The first one is through our alerts. So every survey has alerts, and their alerts more or less is pretty much sending e automatic emails of, yeah, these are the, the objects we should observe or observe. Our alerts are a little bit different. These are stars of interest to specific professional astronomers for one way or another. So we are pretty much sending you an email telling you, oh, there's a new object of interest, and your email will look more or less like this. This is where we're also telling you why you should be observing the object you're observing. What is the scientific merit? You're going to be a collaborator there. You need to know what it is that you're doing, what kind of science you're pursuing. And this is going to help you actually take better data from this project. We're telling you, of course, uh, what kind of uh, data we need, how bright the object is, for what purpose the data is going to be used, etc., etc. And this is a very nice example that actually uh, was shown before of Nova Sagittarius in 2015. Actually, there were four Nova Sagittarius in 2015 for so much reason. Uh, but this is one of my very favorite ones because with black points, you see visual data. With green points, you see V-band data. And with blue points, B-band data. And what you see here is that visual data can actually be as valuable as V-band data, CCD data. So I want to encourage those of you who are visual observers to actually consider taking data of uh, variable stars. What you see in this NOVA, this particular NOVA was really very interesting and very important because it was the first time that shocks were discovered uh, in uh, this type of objects. 
So each wiggle that you see here uh, corresponds to a shock of material that was expanding from the central source uh, with different velocities as uh, faster material was encountering slower material was just colliding and giving a shock. And this was a collaboration with uh, professional astronomers who had um, time on New Star and on Chandra because they were interested in the energetics of shocks. But without lighters, they wouldn't even know what they were looking at. So that's one way that you can actually get involved in projects. You can actually subscribe for our alerts, or you can build your own program. And for that, we have a, a special tool that we released just last, last year. So what do you get out of this? First, we see a whole bunch of stars that are in, uh, of, of interest for observing. Uh, and those stars can be um, at di different types of stars. You can even select what type of star you want to observe between kind of Kissy variables, eclipsy variables, short period, pulsators, long period variables, etc., etc., exoplanet transits. So you get the uh, target information, right ascension declination, which constellation it belongs to, what kind of variable star it is. Uh, the minimum and maximum uh, magnitude, then you could even actually um, sort based on that, and that would actually help you see whether you can observe that uh, particular target based on the means that you have in your hands. Um, the observing cadence, how frequently we want this uh, target to be observed. Um, you also see whether it's a part of an alert or a campaign. Um, you see when the target was last observed. So this is where we're giving guidance to observers to see whether this target does or does not need necessarily data in our database. So when a target is not being observed for a long time, then you see a red flag assigned to it. Once somebody uh, submits a data point, this red flag actually switches to green. So, um, and this is based on the cadence that is defined for that particular target. Uh, with a triangle, oh, with black, you see uh, stars that are behind the sun. So you can't observe them anyway. Uh, here in the notes, high priority targets are the ones that are uh, connected to alerts, because these are very high uh, profile projects that would like to actually would like our observers to pursue and join, and you have all kinds of, of uh, uh, connections or uh, links to the specific alerts. You can get more information about particular target. Um, you can actually customize this tool. You can sign up and uh, put the, your telescope or your observing sites like latitude, longitude, and you can get the targets that are visible from your site every night. You can use this to build your full project, your full program if you want to, or if you already have a program that you really like to observe, have a number of targets you need to follow, but you have a couple of hours in the middle of the night where there's nothing interesting to you, perhaps you can use this as filler targets. So that no telescope time gets wasted. This is, should be legal. You can't waste telescope time. All right, what else are we doing? We want you to participate. We want you to actually try to reduce data yourselves and get results. And for that, we have three different software tools that will help you. The first one is what we call a life group generator. This is a quick lookup of data of a particular star, just to see what kind of data there is there. Um, so this is the new version of the life group generator that we uh, released a couple of years ago. Uh, pretty much uh, you can set the parameters of your star here and even uh, uh, toggle between two and three dates. Um, you can actually zoom in and out. You can draw a box uh, around parts of the light curve, zoom in and out, select filters, whatever filters you want. You can actually see all the observers that observe this particular star and you can select select your favorite one, you have favorite observers, etc. etc. Um, this actually has a capability of uh, connecting to other databases. So moving forward, one of the things that we want to do is attract legacy databases, such as the NOVA database that, uh, that Fred Wolter has of Southern NOVA, where you can actually see the uh, letters of uh, ADS observers and his data overlaid to that and, and see what kind of data there is in there. The second piece of software is called Default. And Default is uh, actually one of our membership benefits um, it actually takes CCD data, uh, processes the data, and it gives you outliers. As simple as that. So this is a data processing uh, tool. Uh, we are actually improving it now to accept this and as well. The third one is VSTAR. VSTAR is actually enabling you to do light analysis. 
Uh, you can do bibliograms, you can upload your own data in here, you can upload data from the ABSO database, you can do whatever you want. So these are tools for you and for your students and for whomever is interested in actually analyzing data themselves. We want you to be able to do your own projects if you want to. And not only that, we want you to publish your data. So for that, we have a journal. And this is a journal of the ABSO. How many of you knew that we had a journal? All right, so for the rest of you, please publish here. This is for you. This is a, a journal that has as a scope to publish solid research. If you have enough material to make a nature paper, send your paper to nature. If you have material to write an app letter, send your paper to app -chain. But there are lots of times that we all have in our hard disks really good solid data good pathology on an object, and we have a nice result on something, but not enough to actually write an aging thing or a monthly notices paper. And usually what happens to the data is just sits in our hard disk and kind of gets lost in a black hole of lost data or something. So this could be a good place for us to publish our work, for you to publish your work. This is a referee journal. It's a double-blind referee journal. So you don't know who the referee is, but the reviewer doesn't know who you are. Or whether you are a professor or a student or uh, a non-professional astronomer, they don't really know. So this way we're trying to take out uh, unconscious biases from referees when they're looking at manuscripts. And actually I can tell you I've lot of you that there have been professional servers who have been complaining to me that, oh, the referee was really harsh. <laughs> <laughs> well, send me a better paper. <laughs> So this is uh, how you submit your, your manuscript to the journey. Uh, at headquarters, we also do data quality control. We even have a group of volunteers to, to help us do that, especially for first-time observers. And we're trying to help give feedback to our observers to help them understand if there's a problem with their data. And actually, that problem doesn't necessarily have to do with the fact that somebody is a, a newbie in observing. It might have to do with Builder will glitches, software problems. We've seen all kinds of things. And the most experienced observers have had discrepant data. And uh, they didn't notice it, but we have. So this is another thing that we do at headquarters. But most importantly, we're building an international community. The ADSO is international. It does not have borders. It's a community that speaks libraries. And we want to actually make sure that we're all communicating through libraries and through various star astronomy and through our forums. So these are places where uh, discussion is happening at all kinds of levels of interest. People are, uh, this is not Facebook, by the way. This is not where people are posting when they have for breakfast, lunch, or dinner or something. Uh, these are places where you're discussing uh, subjects of your interest, such as um, projects, alerts, campaigns, filters, equipment. You want somebody's opinion on something. Um, sometimes people post their letters there and asking for the proposal of opinions. This is a discussion forum for uh, astronomers, such as everyone in this room, to actually bring up a question or uh, actually uh, talk about uh, an accomplishment or even present a science case. So, get started. As simple as that. What you need is to, to identify what you need in order to, to learn how to do this photometry. So perhaps you want uh, a manual, you want to take a choice course, you want a mentor, you want to actually just go out and, and try. It's as simple as the game that we played earlier today. That's exactly what you do. You compare the brightness of the star with the brightness of other stars that are not changing. And we can tell you which ones are the ones that are not changing. Um, Please get an observer code, submit your data to the ABSO. This is a collective effort of trying to get um, as complete data on those variables such as possible. And actually what I would recommend is for you to try to do your science. Analyze your libraries, publish it. But after you publish it, please send us the data. You never know how this data is going to be used in 10 or 20 years from now. Those stars are called variable for a reason. They change. And they tend to change very unexpected ways. Uh, plan your observing program, subscribe to our alerts or ABSO communication, which is our, our um, uh, monthly email class that has some stars of interest. 
Uh, and actually, the idea is so while, while you're sending us data, at some point we're going to be sending you awards when you reach different milestones, celebrating the fact that you have actually sent a number of data in our database and you have accomplished a specific milestone. So with that, I would like to encourage you all to become a member. I would like to fill that little area of South Africa with dots, uh, if possible. You'll find all this information even more on our webpage, aadso.org. This is a contact, contact email, aadso at aadso.org. If you have any questions, send it to the, that email. Most of those are coming to me. So we will answer. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and ask if there are any questions that I could answer right now. Time for one or two questions. So the question about your protocol, do, you, do people also measure the extinction? Like, do you start with measuring uh, the variable? Level? No, but we are uh, instructing people how to correct. Especially for these large images, which are actually huge. We're all here, so if you have any questions, we can definitely I, I have one quickly. Yes. Um, do you know uh, exactly how many observers from South Africa at the moment are contributing? I don't. Okay. I don't. But it seems not many. It seems not many. And how many people do we have in this room? So come tomorrow, how many observations am I going to have? I, I think it's something we need to discuss as, a, yeah. as an organization. One person does um, very well stars, what's going to speak, but not well. Okay, very good. You don't have to be a member to get an observer code. You just sign up in our webpage and ask for an observer code. As simple as that. We want you to be a member, of course. This is, this is a way for us to know that you support the organization. But you don't have to. Okay. All right. Thank you again. So, quick, very quickly. Yes. I've seen the material. Um, Behavior center, check center, and the eye wings, etc. Is the is the information printable? And uh, if I'm not talking about the manuals, that you're talking about. Yes, all our people can download our manuals. Maybe print it, maybe. Yes, you can definitely do that. And actually, for uh, for <laughs> the public, we have we have what we call a ten star tutorial. These are ten stars in the northern, ten stars in the southern hemisphere. Very easy way to get started. And we're trying to promote this for students. Thank you very much, Stella. So our